church, say amen. Just whisper to yourself, I'm grateful. I, I don't need to know what it's for. But if you're awake this morning, you ought to be grateful. If you sat up on the side of the bed and your limbs decided to cooperate with you, you, you ought to be grateful. Even if something hurt this morning, at least you knew it hurt. You ought to be grateful. To the person next to you, you got some stuff to be grateful for. Matter of fact, I'm going to celebrate what you got to be grateful for. I'm going to celebrate. This ain't my celebration. I'm going to celebrate for you. I'm going to celebrate your victory. It ain't happened yet, but I see it on the way. I'm going to celebrate your breakthrough. You can't see it yet, but it's on the way. I'm going to celebrate God's yes, even though you ain't asked the question yet. Church, say amen. Okay, y'all sit down. I, I got somewhere to be at four o'clock, so y'all, y'all can't. We can't take long. We can't take long. I love y'all, but we got somewhere to be at four o'clock. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you don't know, ask somebody. Amen. I want to. I want to hit on something. Or tap it at least this morning. There's something I struggle with from time to time, and hopefully it may be a blessing for you. I want to talk about how do you know that is God? So if I put it in a correct way, how, how do you hear God's voice? Because so, sometimes people have come to me and said, God told them something that, that don't line up biblically, it don't line up theologically, it just don't line up according to grandma's sense. And, and I don't want to say folk are lying, but they have an interesting relationship with the truth. They taught me that in school, yeah, yeah. So, so this morning, I, 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 I kind of want to walk us through some ways to wrestle with this so that maybe what works for me may work for you. Fair enough? All right. The first thing I, I want to establish for you this morning is that you and I need to understand that God speaks through circumstances. Circumstances. Uh, the premise, of course, is that God is speaking, that, that God is involved, that it is He who is calling. It is Him who is nudging, who is prompting, who is guiding, who is disturbing you at 3 a.m. Uh, I, I don't know which word you choose to use, but the premise is that God is involved in our lives, a and, and He does have a will and wants to communicate his will to us. When, when folk come to me and say, Pastor, I, I don't know what God's will is for my life, then I want to walk you through that this morning. And, and the challenge is to see that he uses our life circumstances as a way to communicate those. I, I want us to see that God uses the moments of our lives to communicate to us. I believe he uses the I'm standing in line at the grocery store moments to communicate us. I, I, I want to believe that when somebody picks up the tab 
and you didn't know they were going to pick it up. Those kind of moments. Uh, I don't think you just randomly run into somebody at the airport. A and he uses the, I'm just going to the office again today moments. That all the moments of our lives are right for him to communicate his will to us. I don't believe God lets you experience pain just for you. I believe your pain is, is the way God's going to use you to bless somebody else when they walk in that same pain. We believe that, that God has a call with a capital C, that he just has a purpose for each and every one of us. I'm saying to you very boldly this morning that God has a purpose for your life. And that he has a direction for the whole course of our life. That stuff just didn't happen just to cause it happened. It happened to get you in some places and to get you out of others. But we also believe that God has a call, a little C. That he has a call on your life for the next year, a call on your life for the next month. And God even has nerve enough to have a call on your life for the next 24 hours. I wonder what would change if we really began to get our minds into that place where we'd be willing to listen and willing to respond when God calls us. So here's the challenge I want to give you this morning. The challenge is that when you find yourself in a frustrating circumstance or you find yourself in an unusual circumstance or even if you find yourself in a daily circumstance, Ask yourself this question, Lord, what are you saying to me through this? What are you prompting me? What are you urging me? What, what are you guiding me in this midst of the moment? Last Sunday, I didn't talk about it at all. I was on my way to church, and I was backing out the driveway, and I saw a gentleman riding on one of those tandem bikes and I could see his flag. Uh, I, and so I stopped in my driveway. And as soon as he got past me in the rearview mirror, I started to back out. But something spoke in my spirit and said, stop the car. What I did not see was his wife was behind him in a tandem bike. I saw the husband, but I did not see the wife if I would not have paid attention to that urge, she would have been a casualty. I never saw her, but something inside of me said, no, no, not yet, hold on, wait, come in. Have you ever had an urge when you was about to do something and out of nowhere, coming from no place at all, something said, hold on, wait a minute, you about to mess up, stay still for a while. Brother Nelson, when I saw her go past, something came all over me. Because my mind, Deacon Harrison, started wondering about all the stuff that could have happened. It, 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 it wasn't intentional. She was doing what she was supposed to. I just never saw her. And I got to wondering this morning, how much stuff you never saw God, God kept you from running into it, from running over it, from it happening to It could have gone another way. So when I look back on my life to what God has done in my life and brought me to today, now I'm the person I want my entire story to be about pointing people to Jesus. See, there's nothing special about me. The only thing that's special is that I found a Savior who found me. I see how God uses the events of my life to bring me to this one. I'm standing in a place I never wanted to be, doing something I never wanted to do. So that's the first point. We have to understand, we have to get in our minds in the place that God speaks to us through our life circumstances. So the stuff that happened to you was God speaking to you to get your attention. Where are you right now that's not preventing you from hearing God? That's actually the medium through which he's communicating to you. Was it the doctor's notice? Was it the child's call? 
Was it the loss of this or the loss? Of, what, what circumstances is happening or has happened in your life recently that God was speaking to you? But there's a second way that God speaks to us. And I believe that God guides his servants. We need to believe that God is in the guiding business. Starts in Jonah, the first chapter, verse 1, where we read, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Matthias, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, watch this, and call out against it, for the evil has come up before me. What we see in this verse is that God does have a call on Jonah's life. So he's calling him to go to Nineveh. God says, this is a great city. It's evil now, but God sees its greatness. There's a shout right there. But, but what we don't have is an introduction to Jonah. In fact, the only other time in Scripture we see Jonah is in 2 Kings 14, where it says, spoken through his servant Jonah, spoken through, not, not to, spoken through his servant Jonah, the prophet from gath -Hefer. What we see here is that God is speaking to Jonah, his servant, and a mark of a servant is that they are ready and willing to do whatever the master desires for them to do. Go slow here, pastor. The mark of a servant, you a servant. The mark of a servant, you are a servant. The mark of a servant is that they are ready and willing to do what the master desires for them to do. I've got about three people who believe it. We don't use these phrases very much, master and servant. So, so it might help if we recontextualize them. What if master meant the one who loves you even more than you love yourself? What if the thing that the master is calling you to do is something that your heart already deeply yearns to do? What if what the master invites you is an adventure that impacts history, eternity, and everything else in your life? If we can get our minds there, then we can start to get our hearts in that place where we're willing to be servants of our Father. See, most of us struggle with this call that God has. Because we don't really understand how much God loves us. If you really knew how much God loved you, you stop arguing with him. You, start serving, you stop serving him by convenience. You, you, you might be here this morning. You, you might be that kind of servant. And, and if not, you probably know somebody who is, that the people with the best stories, you hear a story like that and you go, wow, I, it'd be so great if God would call me to do something like that. Again, the premise is this. He's calling, he's guiding, he's leading, he's prompting. He's calling, he's guiding, he's leading, and he's prompting. That's what God does. He guides his servant. So, if I'm a servant, I ought to expect to be guided. He leads us. If I'm a servant, I ought to expect for God to lead me. So, we're following Jesus. The fact is that Jesus says about himself, as the shepherd and his servants as his sheep, here's what he says. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. You're never going to encounter Jesus, and he leaves you in the same mess. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because, here it comes, they know his voice. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. He is guiding his servants. So if I don't know what God is saying. Maybe I'm in the wrong pasture. 
or listening to the wrong shepherd. There, there, there's some tools that we ought to embrace. There, there, there's some practices for hearing God's voice that will help us. You all right? To, to, to be in a posture where we are prepared for listening to what it is that He has for us. So, the third thing I want to share with you now is for the practices for hearing God's voice. Here's the homework. Here's the homework. There's no sense in taking notes if you're not going to apply some stuff. All right? So, so, so we need to, first of all, intentionally build quiet into our lives because most of our lives are always noisy. You come in the house. The first thing you do, besides turn on lights. Come on. Come on. Confession's good for the soul. Some form of noise comes on in your house. One of the revelations when all the kids were gone, when all the kids were gone, I sit in the house one day, I said, you know what? It's just too quiet in here. The dog ain't even barking. So, so we, we have to build into our lives some quiet time. So building quiet might mean turning off the radio in the car. It might mean leaving the cell phone, God forbid, at home. It might be shutting down the laptop, so acting like you're taking notes in service and you know you're looking at something else. We have cameras, y'all. But, but if we don't intensely build quiet into our lives, it's not going to happen. You got to build some quiet into your life. The, the next word is priority. We need to elevate or promote the priority of listening to God. I, I, I challenge you this week to do FaceTime with God before you check Facebook or TikTok or Instagram. I forgot that one. We, we want to hear what He has for us to do. We want to know what it is that He desires for our lives. So this is an act of our will. We do it with volition. So we need to understand where is listening to God a priority in your life? The, the, the next word is proximity. Proximity is that we want to be intimate with Christ. This is a matter of our affections. This is what we desire. We want to draw near to God. The Bible says that when we draw near to God, that the Bible says that when we draw near to God, that the, the Bible says that when we draw near to God, He draws near to us. You, you missed your shout. So all I got to do to get closer to Him is move. And if I move mentally or spiritually, it's in his nature. He has to respond. So if God feels like he's in a distance, he didn't move. I had to move. So the Bible says when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. So I cannot blame any body else for how close I am or I'm not to God. And, and the last word is, God gave you proximity, stillness. You, 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 <laughs> you, you just need some stillness time. Not just quiet, but be still. Yeah. <laughs> You ever get sent to the corner and still be in the corner getting in trouble? You know, some of us have creative children. 
And they don't need anybody else around. They don't need anybody else around to entertain themselves. Not just quiet, but mindfulness. That we shut down just the operation and the task list, and we let that stuff fade away until we're still before the Lord. We know from the Scripture that God does not speak in the earthquake, and God does not speak in the windstorm. But over there in Psalms 46.10, be still. Yeah, that's what it says. Be, 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 be still. Why do I need to be still? And, and, and know, what am I supposed to know? That I am God. So if I really <laughs> want to know that if God is present, he suggested I be still. You, 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 you might want to. Write that still word down. Uh, uh. And then, he, he, here's watch this. Because there's two key words in that verse. Still and no. Yeah, still and no. Still, no. Now, if you connect them two words, it says then, there's a connection between stillness and knowing. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me, okay, I just, I just did calculus, so let's bring it back to addition. The more still I am, the more I know God's will for my life. So maybe the reason I'm confused is I won't be still long enough to know his will. Pastor, I don't, I don't know what God wants me to do. When's the last time you've been still? Instead of calling me, just be still. Quit asking me to pray for stuff you ain't been still about. Still. Some of us are scared of being quiet and still. That's just too much. As if something's going to catch up with you. Maybe for some of us it will, but, but that's a whole other conversation. These are helpful practices, but, but I want to tell you that that very first step on determining God's call on your life is deciding right now how you're going to respond. Decide a response before he calls, his call ever comes. In fact, waiting to see what God's call is and then deciding if you're going to respond, that's kind of cheating a little bit. Work with this, Pastor. Here's a warning. No Lord is a contradiction. No being in oh no. You can't say no and call him Lord. <laughs> you can't call him Lord if you're going to say no. Why would you ask somebody, why would you pray to something you don't believe in? See, why call him Lord and there's a conditional relationship or relationship of comfort? I holler at you when I can. Look at Isaiah 6, 8. Preach this, Pastor. I'm talking to somebody. Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord. Whom shall I send? And who, watch this now, who will go for us? And I said, him I send me. See, Isaiah's response ain't no theological discourse. He didn't have to go to seminary. To get, he didn't go anywhere else. He didn't call nobody. His response is simple and immediate. Here I am, send me. Now, most of us have those words in our vocabulary. Here I am, send me. He was operating out of a posture of obedience. Watch this. Whatever God was calling him to do, Isaiah was ready and willing to do. I, I, I'm going to preach this in church one day. Notice, he didn't ask Lord, will this be convenient for me? 
Is there a training course? Will it come with health benefits? Can you guarantee my safety? What are the girls like over there? Can, can I wear this outfit? What if there's no Starbucks? Should I bring a coffee maker? Will it be in Africa? Should I bring an adapter? He didn't ask any of that. Who gonna pay for it? Isaiah simply says yes. Because Isaiah had determined that the very best possible course for his life was doing whatever it is that God was calling him to do. Your answer is in the whatever. It was a decision he had made ahead of time. Quit giving God a menu to order your life from. And it's a decision you can make right now. So let me ask, since we've been together for about 30 minutes, how are you in this? Are you really willing to do whatever? I, I, you know, it, it's, it's hard sometimes just to get here. Let alone whatever. What time church start? How long it going to be? I hope you out by whatever. Are you ready to be responsive? Or are you sort of hedging your bets with a few excuses? Now, now I done, I done been in ministry for a long time. I, I've heard quite a few excuses. I've even used a few myself. Uh, I, I want to go through a few reasons that we may give to opt out of God's call. Th these are things that I've heard, and, and maybe you've heard them. You have never used them, but maybe you've heard them, and you can take these down to help folk that you want to bless. The first excuse, I'm too young. I'll follow God's plan for my life when I get a little older, when I've learned a few things. Matter of fact, when, when I've had my fun and I get too old to do anything else, when I get out of my prolonged adolescence phrase, the, the Bible makes it clear that God is not at all concerned with how old you are. He will supply you with everything you need right now to respond to his call. This is in spite of resources you may or may not have. It's in spite of skills that you may or may not have. God calls children to phenomenal things every day. Let's see if we got any witnesses. Don't forget that David was a teenager when he defeated Goliath. Joan of Arc was also in her teens when she, shouted, when she routed the English out of France. In this passage, in Jeremiah, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. All servant Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a child. You must go through to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. See, we want to quote our favorite part of the Bible, but not this. You know what God called you to do. What we see in this passage is that God believes in a young Jeremiah. God is present with Jeremiah, and God provides for Jeremiah. Some of you here today, you are young. You might be a young musician, a young teacher, a young business person, a young entrepreneur. You might be a young spouse, a young parent. The word for you today is don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but instead choose to listen and respond to God's call today. So, so the first excuse is, I'm too young. Can you imagine what the second excuse is? 
Oh, this is such a smart crowd. That's why I moved the clock service to 10 o'clock. Smart people come to 10 o'clock service. The next excuse is the opposite. I'm too old. I, I, I used to be a weapon in God's arsenal, but I put in my time. I get confused by this technology. I can't fit in the skinny jeans anymore. Oh, that wasn't supposed to be in there. That was another song. Okay. It be, be, because, so, so what would I do? When, when, when I basically hear this posture, I, it, it bothers me. Because I have discovered the kindest grace givers, the proxy moms and dads, and grandmas and grandpas, the very best children's ministry and smiliest huggers are those who have beautiful wisdom years behind them. They, they, they didn't got too old to pretend. So to my jet set generation, I would say to you, respond like Isaiah, here I am. Send me. I have discovered there's no expiration date for serving God. M maybe the story of Daniel and the lions did, but, but did you know that Daniel was in his 80s when he was punished? That he was punished because of his faithfulness, his righteousness, because of his long service to the king. He was punished because he was so powerful that his threat to the king, other advisors, that's why he got punished. Because in his years, he was wise. Could you imagine what Christendom might look like? And if everyone in their 70s, 80s knew how powerful they were in the Lord. They've been following Jesus for a long time. You're an older business person. You're a grandparent. You're a ministry leader who's got many years under their belt. I would say to you today, you are powerful. So please listen and respond to God's call. Nobody's put you out the pasture. Come on back. Come on home. There's still work for you to do. So I'm, I'm, I'm too young and I'm too old. But this, this third one may be my favorite one. I'm too busy. Yeah. Yeah. T tell, tell the person next to you we're about to enter some turbulence. Because this busy thing tends to cut across all demographics and social economical levels. We, we, we are busy. We just face, we are busy. There's so many duties that demand our attention. There's so many distractions seeking to pull us away. It's a common excuse to use, I'm busy. Can you imagine getting before the Lord and he pulls out the list of stuff he gave me and you to do? I called you to do this, but you was busy. I called you to do that, but you was busy. I called you to be here, but you was busy. I asked you to do that, but you was busy. Could you imagine calling heaven and getting a busy signal? Or being put on hold in the middle of your crisis? Holler at me tomorrow? Be careful that busyness don't get in the way of your blessing. Maybe all this other stuff you got piled up is for you and not for him. What is it that God has really called you to do? Uh, the, the staff that works with me, I, I do this with each one of them annually. They don't like it, but they work for me. And I have to do it with myself. I, I draw a circle that's me. Then I draw a line and put other circles, all the stuff I'm responsible for. Then I ask myself, how much of this is me and how much of this is God? Go home and do that today. All the stuff you're responsible for. You got to be over here. You got to be over there. You, gotta, you know, all the stuff you're busy doing. If I don't show up here, that won't happen. It will. Get sick. It will. 
we busy and oftentimes we're busy pursuing us and forfeiting him. Let me move on to the whole temperature shifting. You all right? Check on the person next to you. Check their pulse. Now, not only am I too busy, but this, 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 this may be worse than busy. I'm too comfortable. I like where I am right now. And I don't want nobody or nothing to bother where I am. I love the 10 o'clock service because it's not too early and I know he got to be out before noon. I, I like my current circumstances too much. I'm just enjoying myself. Could you please pass the dip? People don't really say that. But comfort is at the bottom of all of our excuses. We make a big deal about this. Do you know that the person next to you really likes their comfort zones? And responding to God's call so often calls us to take a risk and darn it, Step outside our comfort zones. God's call by definition is uncomfortable. I, I, Pastor, I would, I would do it, but I would answer. But, but do you know that real life happens outside the comfort zone? That glory is outside the comfort zone. That adventure is outside the comfort zone. That, that God is inviting us into the best part of our life and it pulls us out of our comfort zones. Then, then you might say, well, Pastor, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid of what the implications might be if I totally jump all in. Uh, I'm afraid that saying yes to God uh, might disrupt my agenda. L let me in on a little secret. It will. If you say yes to God, I can guarantee you your agenda will be put on the back door. I, I just want to declare to you very clearly that divine Disruption, divine disruption turns your agenda upside down. Teacher, call on me. Yes, Pastor Troy. I came to Columbus in 1979 for two years on my way back to the ATL. 1979, right around the Last Supper. Two years, 20, didn't even unpack, unpack some stuff. We ain't going to be here long, baby. Lead us, just lead us stuff back. 1979. One baby. 1979. She's the reason we came, because the grandparents made us promise to bring their grandchild to them for two years. It is 2024. And every now and then, the providence of the house asks me, is the two years up yet? Divine disruption. New Salem was nowhere in my purview. Pastor the church, I couldn't spell that. I'm telling you, when God decides to provide divine disruption, it will put your agenda on the back burner. He can turn 
your best laid pants topsy-turvy. Some of y'all came here just to go to school, get your degree, <laughs> and you're still here. But you look at Isaiah, you look at Jeremiah, so many in the Scriptures, how their lives were gloriously disrupted by God's call. For perhaps, maybe, nobody's life was more disrupted, I'm about done, than a young Mary, the mother of Jesus. When you think about Mary, I hope you envision a mid-teenage girl, maybe about her sophomore in high school. You, you, you might want to picture somebody in the church youth group or a niece or maybe a daughter, a friend, or a She's a good girl. She's actually engaged to be married to the town carpenter. But no discernible halo, but, but then an angel shows up and declares to her that she is to be pregnant. C can you imagine this unplanned pregnancy? But to Mary, this was devastating. She knew the law of her time. She knew that to be pregnant outside of wedlock may, meant that she could possibly be stoned. The angel shares some other details. That she's pregnant by divine intervention. Now, that's not bad enough. But then the angel has nerve enough to come back and say, you're carrying the Savior of the world. Now, let me holler at the men. <laughs> you, Joseph, honey, don't be upset. I haven't been unfaithful. I haven't been with anybody else. This is God's baby, and he's the savior of the world. Just keep looking at me, bro. Can, can you imagine that as we read about the heroes of faith, that every twist and turn in the road... No, the reason why they are heroes of the faith is because they chose, come here, to submit to God even when their hearts were pounding or breaking. Disruption? Yeah, Mary had it. Yet I can imagine that when she first held her tiny newborn against the cold of a stable night, she looked up to the heavens and said, God, thank you for this incredible disruption. I can imagine that a few years later when she saw her boy turn water into wine at the wedding at Cana, she praised God and said, God, thank you for your incredible disruption. I can imagine that when she saw her son beaten and bloody, his beard ripped from his face, the crown of thorns stuffed onto his brow, when she saw him nailed to that rough wooden cross. She cried out loud, God, why this horrible disruption? But when she saw Jesus raised to new life, resurrected, glorified, I can only imagine that she said, God, thank you for this glorious disruption. If you want to know why Mary is the hero of faith, you just need to look at how she responded to the angel. She had no idea at all how her white life would be untold and unfold. But she said, yes, before she knew the outcome. Hear her words. I am the Lord's servant. Here it comes. Hmm. May it be to me as you have said. I am the Lord's servant. She knew who she was. She knew she was God's servant. And so such what was about to ever happen, what God was about, she said, may it be to me as you have said. 
no conditions, no strings. No matter what you ask, I'm willing to submit to you. I am the Lord's servant. May it be as you have said. And then finally, submitting to God's call now prepare us to hear God's voice in the future. To submit to God's call no now is a decision that we may deal with. You can do that today. That's what's going to happen, our ears and hear God's voice in the future. And friends, I want to believe that it requires quiet. I want to believe that it requires proximity and priority and stillness. But I would say to you foundationally under all of that, if we're to hear God's voice, is that we've got to decide right now that we're going to submit to His will. The examples that we have in Scripture is none other than Jesus Himself. Jesus, who on the night before He was crucified, prayed to His Father, Matthew 26. He went away a second time and prayed, My Father, may Your will be done. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most powerful prayer you will ever pray. Not my will, but Your will. This is that complete surrender of our lives into the hands of a Father who loves us. And Jeremiah and Isaiah and Mary and Jesus, that's really good company to be in. But so often Jonah is in whose company we're in. You've got to read the end of the book to know that the long road that he took to get there. But now what I want to do is I simply want to encourage you to do some listening. What is it God is calling you to do in the year 2024? What do you sense that God is leading you to do in the next 30 days? Is there something that God wants you to do, go after in the next 24 hours? If we had the chance to sit knee to knee and eye to eye, my guess is that we would take about five minutes for us to land on one thing, that God is prompting you, that God is nudging you, that God is urging you, that God is calling you to do. If you're here, you've never said yes to the relationship of love that Jesus invites you to, That's where to start because he's calling your name. He's calling you. He came because he loves you. He suffered on the cross that your sins would be forgiven. He rose again and invites you into that life. The invitation of Jesus is really simple. It's a relationship of love that starts now and lasts forever. But but, but maybe you're here. You're a follower of Jesus. So maybe what God has for you is he wants you to develop a new friendship. Step out of your comfort zone, maybe cross ethnic lines and develop some relationship. Maybe for you, you you, you know an old colleague who's ill and God's prompting you to reconnect with that colleague. Maybe it's the way in which you treat your spouse. God's urging you to try a new path of compassion and grace. Maybe it's about the way you're raising your children. Maybe for you, you've had a wounding that's so old and God has invited you today to forgive and lay that burden down. I don't know what that is God's calling you to do. I just know he's calling. My challenge to you today is that you would respond to to him and simply say what Jesus said. Not my will, but yours. Not my will. Yours. How many times have I blown the blessing because I chose my will over his? Not my will, but yours. How many times did I tell God, if you do this, I'll do that? And he's still waiting on the that because he did the this. Not, not, not my will, but yours. People going to talk. They going to talk anyway. Not my will, but yours. Usually folk who talk ain't doing nothing. Not my will, but yours. Somebody going to remind me of my past. Well, who in here ain't got a past? We all got a past. Not my will, but yours. 
Pastor, you, you don't know how bad I've been. You don't know how bad I've been. Not my will, but yours. Well, Pastor, when I get some things straight, if you could get them straight, they wouldn't be crooked now. Not my will, but yours. Well, 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 well I, I'm waiting on my husband. I, I'm waiting on my wife. You better get it right for yourself. Maybe God going to use you to lead them. Not my will, but yours. I, 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 I'll make time for my kids to get to church when they school stuff. Not my will, but yours. Eh. Today's the day. God, I pray that my children and grandchildren don't become all Americans and lose out on heaven. They all world, but they miss glory. They get gold medals, but they miss his love. Don't get me wrong, I am a great sports enthusiast, but I never love sports more than I love God. And you better get this thing right. Because they model what they see. I'm never going to watch a game and be quiet. So why would I be hushed when I come to church? If I can cheer for touchdowns, you mean I can't cheer when God crosses the finish line Sunday after Sunday and somebody gets saved Sunday after Sunday and you think I'm just going to sit there, oh, that's nice. No, he's been too good. He's done too much. Not my will. I'm all of that in the community, but I'm going to lose out on glory. You lost your mind. Not my will, not mine, but yours. Not mine, but yours. Not mine, but yours. God, I surrender today. I submit today. God, I'm tired of being tired. I'm tired of losing this fight. I keep coming back to you, God, asking you to change your mind. And you say, what? Well, your will will not be changed. Is there anybody else in this house? Can you hear him? Do you know he's talking to you? you got a call on your life. And it's not a call in the ancient future. It's right now. It's today. It's in this moment. God is calling you to do what only you can. What you going to do? You going to keep stiff arming God? Okay. Let me know how it works out for you. Is there anybody else? Your day? If not here, I'll refer you to any church in the city. I just want you in the family. I just want you to win today. Are you sure? Are you sure? Not my will. I'm my biggest opponent, not my will. I'm my biggest opponent, not my will. I'm my biggest opponent, not my will. Come on, family. Come on, y'all. Y'all ought to be more excited than that. I, I, I just count about five scores. You ought to be more excited than that. Is there any Anybody else in this house or you can be virtual I don't care who you are where you are you need to make a decision today not tomorrow not next week tomorrow
right now. Come on. Come on. Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Come on. Just whisper to the person next to you. Come on. Let's walk down. I'll walk with you. I, I, I'll walk you down there. Come on. Is there anybody else? Come on. You deserve to win today. Is there anybody else? Come on, son. Come on, son. Celebrate one person accept it online. Can I tell you? He's a prayer answering God. Can I tell you? Even when you don't know, He knows. I'm a little messed up. Last Monday, I was in a hospital room, standing by Garen's bedside, because he got some stuff going on with him medically that they can't figure out. He, he's a sophomore in high school. He's quite an athlete. They've told him they got to restrict him from playing ball and wrestling. And the doctors don't really have an answer. At that age, that's the last thing you should be having to worry about. We prayed and we stayed a while. When I walked in, the doctor was asking him some questions. And I assumed the doctor thought I was a relative. And he asked again, he said, you know who that is? Yeah, that's, that's Pastor Keith Troy. The doctor looked somewhat surprised. I said, Doc, he know my voice because he hears it Sunday after Sunday. He said, you, you, you finished your questions. But after you finish your questions medically, I, I got to talk to another doctor. And, and I got to be an intercessor this morning because I've been there. I, I know what it is to have a child. And every now and then, you got to intercede for somebody. And here we are, less than 10 days later, and he walked down here by himself. I still don't know what I don't know, but I do know I serve a God who answers in his own time. When nobody else has an answer, he is the answers. When I don't know, he knows. So when I can't trust nothing else, when medicine don't add up, when you keep telling me what it ain't, I know that God knows what it is. Here's what I depend. If he can make us, he can certainly take care of us. So if he gets it at that age, 
And young Mr. Fowler gets it at his age. What's holding you back? You've had too many things God has done, too many promises he has kept, and you're going to keep playing with God? Have you lost your mind? So, one more time. Is there anybody else in this house who will put their trust in God today? Are you sure? Go back to that person. I don't mean to get on your nerves, but, but Pastor, you know, he ain't going to quit till, till you get up. Because he's already tracked how long it's going to take him to get where he's going. So he knows as long as he gets out of here by two, he'll be all right. Send me one of my altar workers. Now she can't walk on her own. But we can come to her. We can come to her. I've been watching her roll in Sunday after Sunday. want you to win circumstances God sets them up to remind us to care I'm pulling you I'm nudging you I'm guiding you you're gonna get through this and when you get through it you gonna have a testimony that the world will have to stand still and see Now, God is alive and well, and he's still in the miracle business. Church, say amen. Let's celebrate God. Who will believe the report? Val just shared with his pastor. He's been going through a bout. And this week they called and said he's now cancer free. Celebrate God one more time.